Hi Marta and hello class. My name's Nicola. Um, you might have already seen me in some previous lectures. In this series of lectures I'm going to take you through the impact of globalization on art. You might occasionally see my little friend Sabrina popping up so sorry about that. I hope she's not too distracting but she is rather cute. Hello. So first of all what is globalization? The world is becoming increasingly interconnected. This process is called globalization and it has all kinds of implications for almost every facet of modern life. For example, where and how our belongings are manufactured, how much our money is worth, who is in power, how we communicate with one another and spread ideas, where we belong and how we define our place in the world. Now's a good time to pause and have a chat about what you already think of globalization. Do you think it's a good thing or a bad thing? What kind of impact might forces of globalization have on the art world? You probably haven't been able to agree on whether globalization is a good thing or a bad thing. It's a complex and multifaceted issue and it's no surprise that the art world has also responded in a variety of ways. Globalism of art has its pros and cons. It opens up borders between nations artistically, culturally, economically and in many other ways, allowing information to be shared easily and more freely and giving individuals the power to spread ideas through networks of global exchange that cut across geographic and political boundaries. Some argue that globalism creates opportunities in underdeveloped countries Others acknowledge the continued exploitation of workers in developing countries, as the gap between the world's poorest countries and the world's richest is only increasing. Another much discussed side effect of this cultural exchange is the threat of the loss of individual and national identity, as borders become increasingly blurred. Globalism might drown out local, local economies, traditions and languages, and simply recast the whole world in the mould of the dominant West. Where in the past the art world was centred around artists living and working in Western Europe, an increasingly global art world, directed by large-scale international contemporary art exhibitions, embraces artists from a diverse range of backgrounds, speaks to audiences who are globally connected through telecommunications, and is being driven by emerging markets that reflect a shifting global economy. These factors working in unison are contributing to what Italian curator Francesco Bonami describes as so-called global aesthetics, which is, ironically, a Western construction. According to the American curator and 2007 Venice Biennale director Robert Stoll, we can look forward to a relentless melting of aesthetic distinctions, dissolving of institutional barriers and fusion of cultures, resulting in a sludgy, sulfurous magma laced with gold. Storr is not alone in the view that increased globalisation has resulted in less diversity in the art world due to the flattening effect on local cultures. Art critic J.J. Charlesworth argued that globalization has resulted in art that's created to be visually homogenous in order to be consumed easily around the world in biennales and fairs. His, he characterizes this as an art world Esperanto that is legible, understandable and ultimately commercially exchangeable. So, although contemporary art operates on a geographically wider scale thanks to globalism, according to Storr and Charlesworth, it tends to result in more homogeneous work. It's not always clear whether the world is developing a truly global culture or whether globalism is just a code word for the westernization of non-Western cultures. What do you think of the idea that art is becoming more homogeneous? Do you think that a dominant Western perspective is flattening the diversity of art created, particularly by non-Western cultures? Or is it a good thing that contemporary art is becoming increasingly inclusive globally rather than being limited to the traditionally dominant European art of the modernists? 
Have a chat about this now, but this also might be a good question to revisit after you finish all of the lecture series and think, take into consideration all of the art discussed. Art institutions are also being reshaped by global developments. In recent years, museums such as the Guggenheim and the Museum of Modern Art have established programs with a specific focus on acquiring and exhibiting work from areas outside North America and Western Europe. The Guggenheim UBS MAP Global Art Initiative is an immersive collaboration that is challenging a historically Western-centric view of art. We're expanding our collection with work from three regions, South and Southeast Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East and North Africa. The project brings together curators, artists, and influencers across cultures for thought-provoking exhibitions, artist-based educational programming, and online conversations about innovation in contemporary art. Looking back only a few decades, and it's possible to see just how much progress has been made on this front. In 1984, an international survey of recent painting and sculpture opened at MoMA. Of the 169 artists on display, only 13 were women, and most were white male artists from the United States and Western Europe. Almost 20 years later, Documenta 11 was organised by its first non-white curator, Nigerian-born Okwi in Weza who included artists from countries that had previously been overlooked, including Korea, Lebanon, India, South Africa, Iran and China. Art institutions are also responding to global economic shifts. New art collectors are emerging from different parts of the globe. Institutions such as Sotheby's and Christie's report ever-increasing numbers of different countries registered to bid in contemporary art auctions with large proportions of sales going to expanding markets such as China, India, Russia and the UAE. Europe and the United States are no longer the only hubs of the art world. China is viewed as one of the fastest growing art markets. In 2007, five of the ten best-selling living artists worldwide were Chinese, compared with only one three years earlier in 2004. One of the leading Chinese artists, Zhang Xiaogang, made $56 million in auction sales. In her talk, Thoughts on the Globalization of Art, sociologist Sarah Thornton discusses the growth in global audiences and markets for contemporary art. Uh, a belief in contemporary art as, in terms of conceptual art, which embraces ready-mades and, and things not made by the artist's own hand, uh, really started in Europe and North America. And for many, many years, it was, you know, a dialogue between New York and L.A. and Cologne and Berlin and uh, various other uh, European metropolises, to some extent also Latin America. Uh, but there were vast parts of the world where contemporary art was just not on the agenda at all. Huge parts of Asia, um, particularly China, where, you know, which got cut off because of communism, and, um, and, and also swathes of Africa, where um, the luxury of something like this really didn't make sense at all. Uh, I've done quite a bit of research over the years on the Warhol market and written about Warhol in the pages of The Economist. And um, one, it's interesting to kind of look at that as a case study and, and as a kind of see the way sometimes an artist market can tell you about how a globalization, how globalization of the belief in art is shifting. And um, for many years, the most popular uh, subject matters for Warhol were Marilyn Monroe, Elvis, Marlon Brando. Um, and he is very much an artist whose, um, the hierarchy of his oeuvre is very much uh, related to subject matter. And um, what, when these Maos were first made in 1972, uh, and I interviewed Bruno Bischofsberger, the Swiss dealer who first showed them in Zurich, uh, not a single painting was sold. And they were a hugely unpopular series. And um, as Bruno Bischofsberger uh, told me, you know, not only did they not sell, but he 
kept them in a garage that was unlocked for many years. And um, he, uh, he and as he explained, he said, you know, what Swiss businessman wants an oversized communist on their wall? Uh, you know, Mao in those days, you know, he was still alive and he was, he was a, uh, you know, a tyrant and a dictator. Uh, and uh, so hugely unpopular um, and, and, and never, never making a good showing at auction. Um, but in 2005, uh, it, it was quite astonishing when this particular work became the record price for a Warhol at auction selling for $17.45 million. And uh, what that indicated really was that the Chinese had arrived, that they were uh, making prices and um, uh, affecting artist markets. And you can see that repeatedly at auction. You know, the Rothko market uh, is, you know, ha has a long standing. Um, uh, interest amongst Americans, but uh, the the Rothko was Russian and a Russian Jew, and a lot of the Russian oligarchs identified with him and liked to buy their own, and so a Russian interest in Rothko helped pump up prices. And also in the Arab world, there's a huge love of abstraction, and so Rothko uh, became a coveted uh, artist there, and 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 so not long after this sale of the Mao, uh, a, the Rockefeller Rothko, uh, as it had been called, uh, sold, became the, uh, the painting that had sold for the highest, it was, let's see, let me get the data right. Uh, it was the highest price ever paid for a post-war work of art. And um, that was up in the um, $70 million range. So just indicators of globalization. Thornton also discusses art as an investment and the impact of global economic trends on the art market. I think one thing, interestingly, that has spread a belief in contemporary around art around the world is the fact that art has become an asset class. And um, although that was happening before the financial crisis, the the fact that many um, financial advisors started advising their high net worth clients to invest in art re started remarkably in late 2008, early 2009. Um, and that was partly because there was a great loss of faith in things that had previously been solid investments, like banks. Um, and. Uh, while shares in, let's say, Lehman Brothers were worth nothing overnight, you know, at least your de Kooning drawing was still worth something in a bad market. Um, and uh, what happened, what, what became the great indicator uh, was a, a sale that happened in February 2009 in Paris in the depths of the recession, um, it, which was, had spread around the world. Uh, there was a sale of Yves Saint Laurent's uh, art collection. And at that sale, record prices were made over and over and over again, and it became the, um, the it, it set, a writer, set a record for a sale as a whole and also set individual records for Brancusi and Mondrian and, and uh, an Eileen Gray chair sold for some $30 million. So why do you think this is? What is it about art that is so inherently valuable that it seems to defy traditional systems of finance, such as the stock market? I don't think there is necessarily one distinct answer to this question, but it is interesting food for thought.